Okay. I think, I think we're there now. So um, let me go ahead. I'm sure people will keep uh, trickling in. Um, I want to welcome, welcome everybody to uh, our August uh, Houston Functional Programming Group. We are back fully online. Uh, we, we had thought it was safe to go back into hybrid and we did that a couple of months and now with Delta um, and a bunch of us having unvaccinated children at home, we've decided to move completely back uh, virtually um, for the foreseeable future. Um, I don't think we have any other business. Is there anything people want to bring up before I introduce our speaker for today? Okay. All right. Um, so I'd like to um, introduce uh, Richard Feldman, who uh, works for No Red Inc., um, is a well-known Elm evangelist. Um, if you haven't had a chance to see his talks uh, or listen to interviews on podcasts, um, I highly recommend it. He's, he's really, really um, good and dynamic and very enthusiastic speaker. Um, lots of good energy. Uh, he's also the author of uh, Elm in, Ang in Action from Manning. Um, Manning was supposed to send us some gift codes, um, and they didn't. And I'm remembering that right now. So I might um, contact them about that. But um, and today he wants to talk about uh, transitioning from uh, their conventional uh, code base to uh, essentially fully functional, fully uh, purely functional uh, Haskell and Elm. He also um, asked if uh, he's working on a new programming language uh, called Rock, I believe it is, um, which he describes as a work in, pro in progress, pure functional language descended from Elm, which compiles to binaries. It's easy to, uh, it's designed to be easy to introduce to existing systems and to ship with an ambitious IDE. Um, and so I'm hoping he'll talk a little bit more about that because that sounds great, but I actually have no idea still from that <laughs> description what it actually is. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Richard. Uh, Thank you very much. Sure, uh, Paul, you raise your hand. Did you have a I wanted to ask, what is the Rock webpage? Oh, it's uh, ROC-Lang. I'll just put it in the chat. Because, um, I mean, this is not a conference talk. It's a meetup, so we can be kind of casual. <laughs> uh, but there's nothing there. I went and looked at it. And I mean, it, there, it, there, are, it just... there are links to videos explaining more about it, yeah. which might oh, be hard to watch in parallel with <laughs> this, but check them out afterwards. Um, yeah. Josh actually works on the compiler, uh, so he can also uh, oh. ask questions, potentially. Um, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, let's let's dive into it. Um, let me share my screen. Oh, you know what? Hang on. I think I need to share the whole screen because otherwise, as soon as I full screen, it's gonna go away. All right. Let's see. Can everybody see? Okay. Yes. Good to go. Awesome. All right. So this is uh, Millions of Users, Purely Functional Code. I'm Richard Feldman. Um, so uh, as Claude previously mentioned, I work for a company called No Red Ink. Uh, and basically, we help teachers teach writing through software. Um, I joined back in 2013. Uh, this was the team. There's also one person who was remote. But at the time, we were all in an office, although now we're fully remote. Uh, and this was true before COVID. We were, we were a very remote company. Um, we have people in the US and Canada and uh, Argentina, uh, Brazil, various places in Europe. Um, we're, we're quite a distributed team nowadays. Um, but back then, very small company. Um, but it's been you know, quite some time since 2013, and a lot has changed. Um, so comparing some things that have changed between 2013 and now, uh, we had five employees then. Probably by the end of the year, we will be over 100 employees. Um, of that, about a quarter will be engineering, and the rest is like sales and you know, uh, curriculum and stuff like that. Um, at the time, I actually <laughs> did a checkout on, on the day that I started. It was almost 60,000 lines of code in the whole code base. Um, and now it's a, a little over like 1.2 million, all told. Back then, we had thousands of users. Now we have millions of users. Um, and back then, uh, when I joined, we had no money, uh, we, we, except for what investors had given us. Um, because uh, when I interviewed, that was actually one of the questions that I sort of grilled the CEO on. I was like, now, is this not, this isn't going to be one of these Silicon Valley companies that just never sells anything and just 
takes, keeps taking investor money until it all runs out. And he was like, no, no, we have a plan. And sure enough, uh, he was right. And actually last year was the first year that we turned a profit. Um, as in like between the end of the beginning of the year and the end, we had more money in the bank account than uh, at the beginning. And that was not because we took on any investment or anything, which we didn't, uh, but just from money from customers. Um, I should note that that probably will not be true again in 2021. 2020 was a weird year for lots of companies, no rating concluded. Um, and that was somewhat of an unusual circumstance, but it did at least demonstrate like, hey, this can be a profitable business, certainly. Um, and we're, you know, uh, right at that line, even though we, our preference would be to sort of like grow and, uh, rather than uh, aiming for profitability or maximizing profitability. Um, and of course, when I joined the company, we didn't do any functional programming at all. Um, it was just a stock sort of Ruby on Rails. Uh, we used CoffeeScript, which back in 2013 was a, a lot more common choice than it, than it is today. Um, and today uh, we're sort of all in on functional programming, like pure functional programming, Elm on the front end, Haskell on the back end, uh, Nix for some of our operational stuff. Um, we're really like sort of all about pure functional programming. Um, so I want to talk about how we got there um, and how like what functional programming has done for our business, uh, because I know that a lot of talks are about sort of like the theoretical nice things about uh, FP about like, you know, it's conceptually nice, it's elegant. Um, but this is about a business. This is about like, you know, we built up a company um, on the back of FP and how we did it. Um, so let's start with Rails, because this is where we were when I joined the company. Um, if you're not familiar with Ruby on Rails, uh, it's basically uh, Ruby is a dynamically typed programming language. Rails is a framework that deals from with everything from uh, how you deal with the database through an ORM uh, to like how you render your front end. It's very opinionated, sort of famously so, um, and it's got a lot of uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of web specific stuff going on there. Um, Rails sort of like wants to own your whole stack and uh, and Generally, that's how people use it, sort of like a one big monolithic Rails application. Um, uh, also in 2013, um, at slightly shortly after I joined the company, um, uh, I found out about this talk uh, that, that was sort of ma making the rounds. Um, this is called JS Apps at Facebook, but really uh, you might think of this now as the React talk because this was where they introduced React to the world and, and open sourced it that previously had just been used internally at Facebook. Um, React today is probably the most popular, <laughs> actually, I say probably, it's definitely the most popular um, way to do front-end applications. Um, but at the time, this was kind of a new thing. We were actually early adopters of React. Um, so back then, uh, back in 2013, it was like, the, the appeal of it uh, to, to someone like me was this functional style of rendering. I had a coworker in a previous job who'd really encouraged me to, to try out functional programming. And I'd sort of done some like functional style stuff in previous jobs. But um, React really seemed like it was like going more in that intentionally in that direction than any of the JavaScript libraries I'd used before. Um, seemed like a pretty nice API to me. Uh, seemed like a good way to man, like deal with state. It had kind of a, a good story around that relative to other tools that I've been using, like Angular JS and stuff like that. Um, and it also seemed pretty well supported. Um, it didn't seem like some like flash in the pan, you know, kind of like someone's weekend project. This was like they'd been using it at Facebook for quite a while, and they were you know open sourcing what they were already using in production. So seemed like it was a, a relatively safe thing to try out and seemed like it could bring some benefits. So what we did was a controlled experiment. Um, we basically said, okay, let's, let's try to figure out how we can find a low risk project that's like a good fit for this technology we're trying to evaluate. This is kind of our recipe for how we have tried new things out at, at Norwood Inc. Um, step two, like get it all the way into production, like just get this small low risk project into production. So don't try to pick something like big, that's gonna take a long time, um, just something small and you know, get it all the way into production in such a way that you know, if it turns out that the project doesn't pan out, well, it's okay, we picked a low risk one anyway, and uh, we can always you know, roll it back if we end up being unhappy with it. Um, of course, if we are happy with it, then we can just sort of expand incrementally from there such that each individual step we take is low risk. And then eventually if it looks like, okay, we've got a sizable thing going here, like React actually seems like what we want to do for our whole front end, let's adopt it. And that's exactly what we did. So we ended up basically deciding, um, let's go ahead and, uh, and adopt React. Now I want to um, take a moment to talk about TypeScript because TypeScript existed when uh, actually before React was open source. This was a, a talk from uh, GoTo 2012, um, uh, like introducing TypeScript to the world. Um, but uh, maybe it's hard to remember now because TypeScript is now, in fact, TypeScript and React is, uh, <laughs> is probably the most popular way to do new front end projects these days in the web world. Um, but back then TypeScript was not taken very seriously. Um, I mean, to be fair, React had a lot of detractors when it first came out, but, but I mean, you gotta remember that at the time, TypeScript was coming from Microsoft and in the web world, 
Microsoft was far and away known for one thing, which was not VS Code yet, it was Internet Explorer. Not exactly a good brand to have if you're a uh, web developer. Like you're the, uh, the Microsoft is the source of all of our pain. I remember when I joined Noreen, we were supporting Internet Explorer 8, and uh, that was not a, a fun experience. So for Microsoft to come out and say, hey, web developers, uh, we've made this amazing tool for you, it's like, aha, uh -huh, really? Yeah, you don't say. Um, but obviously, you know, over time, TypeScript uh, got more and more adoption, and uh, now it's quite popular. Now, I bring up TypeScript because in 2013, the idea of using React with TypeScript uh, was completely outlandish. This was not something that was, uh, it was, it was as far from mainstream as you could get. Um, but uh, I bring this up because we actually had a problem, uh, which ended up leading us to Elm. Now, before I get to the Elm part, I just want to take, take a second to talk about, like, basically, why didn't we end up using TypeScript to solve this particular problem? The problem that we had was essentially that we were using uh, React and plain JavaScript. Okay, it was actually CoffeeScript, but same basic idea. So no type checking uh, was, was sort of the, the root of the problem that we ended up having. The problem that we had was we were building this feature and we really care about efficacy at NoReading. We really want our features to not just work in the traditional sense, but like to actually have an impact on the students. And the, as it happened, this feature was for teaching active voice and passive voice, which is a pretty tricky thing to teach, especially to middle schoolers. And what we found was that the design we came up with, once we would take it out to a classroom and try it out, we'd find that the students just weren't getting it. It wasn't effective. So we'd go back to the drawing board and revise it and go bring out another version, sort of like an MVP that we could, we could try out on, the, on the, the next group of students. And that one would also fail. We'd go back to the drawing board and we kept iterating on this. But what I noticed was that in between these iterations, it was taking a really long time to get something working again that was able to actually you know, uh, be usable in a, in a classroom. I mean, it couldn't just be smoke and mirrors. They had to actually be able to use it well enough to see whether or not it was going to be effective with them. And in part, that was because, you know, back in the JavaScript era, um, pretty much the only tool we had to help us like make substantial changes, you know, like all, almost on the level of a rewrite, but not quite, um, were tests. And as it happened, these changes were so big that we would basically have to throw out all the tests um, every time we made a, the, these substantial changes. So types would have helped out a lot, but you know, the idea of using TypeScript is like, yeah, that that's not that's not really on anyone's radar. Um, but Elm was on our radar by coincidence because I had personally, uh, as for some side projects, been using Elm outside of work. And I really liked it. Um, I thought that it was an amazing language. It was really ergonomic. Um, you know, the, the friend who had been recommending functional programming to me uh, had basically talked about Haskell. And Elm felt to me like I could get a sort of Haskell-like experience, not having actually used Haskell, um, in the browser, which was where I wanted to, to work. I was sort of a front-end UI specialist at the time. And so I'd been using Elm and I was thinking, wow, when, when I use Elm and I need to make big changes like this, I don't have to have any tests helping me out. I have the compiler helping me out. And that's largely because of type checking rather than functional programming. And I want to acknowledge this to make the point that, to be perfectly honest, if we had been exactly the same position except today instead of back then, we probably would not have adopted Elm. We probably would have gone with what everybody else did, namely TypeScript, because that was just the obvious low risk thing to do. Um, if you're having trouble with, with types, you probably go TypeScript in this day and age. Um, and we really would have missed out on a lot. So I feel pretty fortunate <laughs> that TypeScript was not as popular as it is today because I know a lot of people who are using Elm on the front end and TypeScript on the back end or who use TypeScript at work for their front end and uh, Elm in their personal time. Let me tell you, it is not the same thing. Uh, it's not just the types. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very big gap. And in fact, we still get a lot, a lot of applicants who are coming from TypeScript jobs because they want to use Elm. More on that later. Okay. But if you're not familiar with Elm, um, let me just give you a quick breakdown on what it is. So Elm is a pure functional programming language. It compiles to JavaScript, but other than compiling to it, it really has no relation to JavaScript. Elm is its own language designed from scratch. It has no JavaScript semantics, except by coincidence. Um, it's really just its own completely separate language. And it basically treats JavaScript as like bytecode that it's compiling to. Um, that's the only, its only relationship. It does have JavaScript interop if you want, but that would be true regardless of what it was compiling to. Um, so what do I mean by pure functional? What I mean is that all Elm functions are pure, so no side effects, everything's immutable. Elm has full type inference, like 100%, never gets it wrong. Um, and it's also completely sound type inference. So it, uh, unlike TypeScript, which famously has an intentionally unsound type system, the Elm type system actually is sound. Um, there's no null or undefined either. Uh, Elm has the best package manager. And when I say the best package manager, I want to clarify 
because you might think that I'm saying Elm has the best package manager of any programming language I've ever used, which it does by far. <laughs> um, I, I also spent a lot of time with Rust and I went to a meetup where someone was giving a presentation on Rust and they were like, Rust has the best package manager I've ever used. And I thought, ah, this is a person who hasn't used Elm, neat. Um, Rust, for, for the record, has the second best package manager I've ever used. Um, but yeah, if you haven't used Elms, um, just a quick taste, it enforces semantic versioning. And what I mean by that is, if I try to publish a package which makes a breaking API change, like I change a type, or I delete a function, or something like that, uh, that would be a breaking change that would break compilation, it actually will not let me publish the package unless I bump the major version number. So the experience of upgrading packages in Elm is unlike what I've experienced in any other language um, because it just works. Like I go to upgrade things and then it's just a very nice, pleasant experience. And even if there is a breaking change, which does happen from time to time, the compiler helps me through it because Elm has the nicest error messages of any programming language I've ever used. Um, again, I'll draw a comparison to Rust because it's another language I'm familiar with. Um, I've also seen people say, wow, Rust has the best error messages I've ever seen. Um, uh, if you've had that feeling, I would encourage you to go read the blog post where they announced uh, their, their sort of effort to revamp Rust's error message and improve them because you'll see in that blog post, they talk about what we're aiming for is to make our error messages like Elm. <laughs> and I would say they did a pretty good job of it. Um, Rust's error messages are quite nice. Um, but this is still the gold standard in my book. Uh, I still have not seen uh, Rust or any other language like come close to that. So if you've not given Elm a try, uh, please give it a shot uh, because this is a great experience when you pull these things together. Um, a quick taste of that. So this is an example of one of these error messages. Um, I just pulled this out of some random file in our code base. Uh, this is like our, our uh, file that like reports errors to bug snag, which is what we use for error tracking. Um, so this is a type mismatch. So this bug snag config record does not have a release stage field. And it's highlighting this thing that's uh, underlined. It's like, okay, well, why doesn't it have a release stage field? And the answer is because I made a typo. It says, this is usually a typo. Here are the bug snag config fields that are most similar. And you might notice that I have misspelled uh, release stage as release stag, which is not quite right. And then it says, it just suggests, hey, so maybe release stage should be release stag or vice versa, um, which is exactly the typo that I made. Um, this is a pretty representative error message. Uh, like it's similar with like other like uh, types of type mismatches or other types of errors. Um, the compiler just really gives you as much contextual help as you can. And I have not seen another language that does it as well as Elm does. Um, so having had a good experience with Elm with my side projects and uh, knowing that we had this problem with React and TypeScript not really being a, a reasonable option to consider back in uh, at the time. It wasn't 2013. I think this was uh, 2015, actually, maybe 2014. Um, we decided to do another controlled experiment to see about adopting Elm. So again, find a low-risk project that's a good fit, get it all the way into production, and then either expand incrementally or back out. So that's what we did. Um, we introduced it on just like one part of one page. Um, as it happened, it was uh, this this same. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This was not this is not the active voice packet voice. This is a a different thing where we had. Um, Lots of uh, it's basically a drag and drop interface where there was a lot of complicated rules uh, around this because you could actually pick up uh, sort of like chunks of a sentence at once and the wrapping rules got pretty complicated because we wanted these to look like um, real sentences. So if you dropped this, you know, in between berries and new, for example, um, we would want to wrap in the middle of this chunk so that it wouldn't, you know, uh, like jump all the way to the next line and have a really awkward break right there. But at the same time, we also wanted it that when you picked it up, it would sort of snap back into being sort of one contiguous block like this. So there were a lot of tricky things to get right about this uh, from the perspective of business logic. But hey, like great, complicated business logic. Elm is awesome at that. Um, you know, I mean, it's awesome at rendering as well. But uh, we, we knew that this would help us out here. And of course, if we didn't like it, well, it was all you know behind the scenes. It wasn't even doing any rendering. Um, so it'd be pretty easy to just back it out, throw it out, and just rewrite just that one small chunk of stuff in you know uh, JavaScript or, or CoffeeScript or whatever. So we did, and we liked it. And we started using it more and more, so such that you know in 2013, we adopted a little bit of React. 2014, we sort of solidified our use of React. And then 2015, uh, was when we introduced that that first experiment of Elm, and then 2016, it pretty quickly grew and grew and grew, just as React had before, until it basically took over our code base. And today, essentially everything except for really really old legacy code that we haven't bothered to touch in years, um, <laughs> literally years, uh, is all in Elm, uh, except for a tiny bit of JavaScript interop for some like uh, there's like a, a WYSIWYG uh, rich text editing thing that we use in JavaScript, for example. There's a couple of really small things that we do JS interop with, but 99 point something percent of our code base is L uh, for, our, for our front end. Um, so it, it really 
took off from those sort of small, humble origins of a, of a small controlled experiment. Um, Okay, so uh, uh, this is a talk about our business. So let me just sort of enumerate the top three benefits to our business that I, I've seen, um, you know, retrospecting over the past, uh, I guess, six years now of, uh, of having used Elman production. Um, I'm going to go in reverse order because the first one might surprise you. Uh, so number three, uh, more reliable software. So we've had basically zero production crashes. Um, there was a blip in 2018 where we, we finally got our first runtime exception in the aforementioned uh, bug snag blogs. Um, that actually originated from Elm code as opposed to from JavaScript code that we were doing interop with. Um, basically what happened was we, we used a language feature that was potentially capable of crashing. That feature is actually no longer in the language. So if we'd been using the version of Elm that we're using today, even that one wouldn't have happened. We'd still have a spotless record, but alas, we did use it. We did have a crash. And uh, ironically, I used to tell people we'd had no um, runtime exceptions. And I think a lot of people wouldn't believe me. And then once I said, uh, we finally had one, everyone believed me like, oh, your, your error reporting is working. Uh, it, just, it just actually Elm wasn't crashing. Um, and Elm's designed to be that way. I mean, it's, uh, it's not impossible to crash an Elm app. I mean, we did it, but also like you can still get stack overflows. There's still like a couple of ways. There's like, I think there's seven of them that you can, <laughs> seven different ways you can possibly crash an Elm app. But the point is that it's so hard to do accidentally that in practice, it's very rare. Like when I'd go to speaker dinners back in the before times when we had in-person conferences and stuff um, at Elm conferences, I, it was like a fun game I would do. I'd uh, ask the speakers like, hey, how many of you using Elm in production at work? You know, several hands go up. Um, I'd ask them, how many of you ever gotten a run, runtime exception at work in production? And all the hands would go down. I think one time somebody told me that they had a, a runtime exception. It was some very unusual case. Um, but this is only the, the third most beneficial thing that I think uh, we've gotten out of Elm, if I'm, if I'm being honest. Second one is actually just making changes be faster and cheaper. Um, so when I say making changes, what I mean is like changes to the software. So, you know, this is a company that's been around for about eight years. Like, you know, it was, there were some people working on it before I joined, of course. Um, and, uh, the amount of time that it takes us to modify like existing code that we've had and like get it to a point where we're confident shipping it again is just great. It's really, really fast. Um, I don't think Elm is quite as fast. Like even, even now, like being being an expert in Elm, um, I would be able to ship something new in Elm faster than React because it's been so long since I've done any React. But I remember like what it was like back then. And, I, and if I'm being honest, I do think it was a little bit faster to ship something if I'm, if I'm just like, like a prototype or something like that. My rule of thumb was sort of like, if it's gonna take a month or longer, I think Elm will be will, will more than pay for itself and end up being faster within that time period. But any project that's like less than a month in duration, uh, maybe will not pay for itself um, in terms of like turnaround time. But over time, I mean, we end up spending much more time going back and making modifications to existing things, building on top of what we built before. All of that stuff is definitely much faster than it was before. I can't personally compare Elm to TypeScript because we sort of like, jumped over that and went straight from you know untyped JavaScript to Elm. Um, but from what I hear, other people like comparing their experiences with TypeScript and their experiences with Elm, this is still true, just not to the same degree as it would be comparing Elm and JavaScript. Um, but again, this is our story about our business. And the number one benefit to our business, and like I said, I think this will come as a surprise to people, and I think this is uncontroversial if you ask the leadership at the engineering department at Norad Inc., is hiring. It is so much easier to hire people because we use Elm. And I mentioned this might be a surprise because there's this meme, and I understand where it comes from. I, I assumed the same thing before we actually started using Elm, um, which is that, oh, if you use like a you know, sort of a niche functional programming language like Elm or Haskell, you won't be able to hire anyone. It's the opposite. It's so the opposite. I can't even express to you how far the opposite it is. I don't know how we ever hired anyone before we had Elm. Um, we used to struggle to find front-end engineers. Like after me, like I was hired with the title of like front-end engineer. It was two years before we found someone who we liked and who was willing to join our company because we didn't have anything to make us stand out. It's like, hey, we're using React. It's like, yeah, you and everybody else, you know, tell me what's actually special about you. But when we say we're using Elm, there's a lot of people out there who would love to use Elm at work but they can't because most companies are afraid of it, ironically, because they're afraid they won't be able to hire anyone. <laughs> um, so it's it's such an amazing benefit that like I can even just talk openly about it. And I know that most companies are not gonna bother or maybe they won't believe me, I don't know, but um, it, it continues to be our secret sauce. Uh, it's it, it, Even though it's not really a secret, um, we, we shout it from the rooftops. And then I mentioned, like I will right now, we're hiring. <laughs> um, and that's that's kind of how it works. Um, and I've heard the same thing from other Elm companies. Like I know we're within the Elm community, we're a particularly prominent 
like Elm organization. Um, Evan Schiflicki, who created Elm, worked here for like three years. Um, and you know, we, we have a lot of like prominent members of the Elm community and, and conference organizers and stuff working here. Um, but even for companies where that's not the case, like uh, what I've heard from them is that they've had an easier time finding good programmers. Um, I don't know what it's like if you're, you know, kind of like just trying to hire in bulk, like just just going for sheer numbers rather than um, trying to find really strong programmers. Um, but from most companies that I, I seem to find uh, interested in Elm are kind of looking for more of, of like strong programmers uh, anyway. So um, I'm not kidding when I say that's like the number one benefit. And to give you an example, it's literally earlier today, we just hired a new recruiter and she was talking to me and just, you know, kind of like getting to know you stuff. Um, and she was like, yeah, like, I've been, I've been sitting on a couple of interviews with people and it seems like everybody wants to work here because of this Elm thing. Like what's, uh, what's that all about? You know, <laughs> like she doesn't even need to know what it is. Like you can't, you can't not know that if you're a recruiter for a company that uses Elm, like it's just, it's going to come up because that's, that's just a draw. Um, so that to me is, if I'm being honest, I mean, I know it's a non-technical benefit, but like the benefit to the business is really difficult to overstate how, how great it's been. Um, okay. Yeah, that's a, something like a magnet for, uh, for strong programmers. Um, okay, but uh, not everything has benefits, everything has costs too. So let's talk about the top three costs of the business. Um, number three, this is, comes as no surprise, the package ecosystem for Elm is smaller than NPM. A lot smaller. I mean, NPM is like the biggest package ecosystem in existence. Mostly that doesn't matter in the sense that um, like NPM has, I think it's at last count, it was like a gazillion packages. Um, 99.9999999999% of those packages you never use and never want to use. There's, you know, there's, it's just like, there's a finite set of packages that you actually want, um, you know, in the world as, as a, someone making software. Um, and there's just these like small set of them that are important to you, but it definitely does come up that, you know, sometimes there's something where we're like, ah, I really want a, a uh, calendar picker that has these particular characteristics and the calendar pickers in the Elm package ecosystem, like none of them happen to have that particular combination of things that we need for our particular calendar picker. Literally that example came up once. Um, and we ended up using JavaScript interop, which was, you know, it didn't feel great, but uh, what can you do? Um, number two, and this is kind of a variation of the third one, but it is different in kind of an important way, which is fewer off the shelf SaaS integrations. So I showed you some bug snag code earlier. When we first adopted bug snag as our um, production error tracking system um you know they have off the shelf they're just like hey here's if you want to integrate with bug snag here's javascript bugsnag.js just go ahead and use that but if you want to use elm that doesn't really exist and unless you've gotten lucky and found that you know some other company happens to be using exactly bug snag um, in the elm community um you know you basically need to write your own integration or use the javascript one through interop and so we ended up writing our own like you know bug snag elm uh, package and, and you know open sourcing it um, but I found that this one comes up a lot more often than the number three version. Like in general, if we're looking for a package, like something that's a like really common use case, usually we can find it like more often than not. But when it comes to some particular third party company tool that we're using, it's like the opposite. Um, more often than not, we, we're just like prepared that like if we're integrating with a new system, we're probably going to have to write our own integration against their like raw HTTP. Now, I know that some people consider this to be like the end of the world. Like it's the actual apocalypse when you have to do this. We, it's such a drop in the bucket. Like, we just don't care. I mean, <laughs> like, yeah, like, yes, we had to write our own bug snag.elm. It maybe took us like a week. Like, it was fine. Like, we, we, Elm has so astronomically more than paid for itself, like, compared to the number of times we've had to do that, which has been like two or three. Um, it's just not even close. So, like, we don't consider that a significant drawback. But I mentioned it because a lot of people do. And if I'm honest, even though it's a not very significant drawback, I mean, obviously, we consider the benefits to far outweigh the costs here. Um, you know, it is the number two. The number one actually was just a 2018 version upgrade took a long time for us. Uh, this was Elm 0.18 to 0.19. And the specific reason it took us a long time was, well, I mean, there was a couple of reasons, but basically there were a number of breaking changes that happened to uh, be pretty pervasive across our code base. We liked all the upgrades. Um, like it was definitely like once we finished the upgrade, we were very, very happy with, uh, with all the improvements, but it did take a long time. Um, since then, though, the language has been quite stable. Um, there's there's been one release since then, and it was a like minor release that you, you just upgrade to. You didn't have to like do anything. Um, and it looks like the next one after that is also going to be a, most likely a minor release with like no breaking changes. Um, but you know, uh, if you're if you're on a like pre 1.0 language, you know, part of the reason for having Elm be uh, not say it's 1.0, even though it's you know been quite a few years now, um, is to communicate that like yeah, breaking changes are going to happen. And fair enough, this was a significant cost that we had to pay to to make that upgrade. 
And although we considered it worth it, it was the number one cost that uh, I think our business has paid um, to use Elm. But I mean, I guess if you're coming in today, you won't have to go through that because you'd probably be <laughs> building on the, the current release anyway. Okay, so, um, so that was Elm in like 2015. Um, so in 2016, it comes around and we are sort of uh, reevaluating Rails. We've been using it for our backend since the beginning and we're getting kind of unhappy with it because of something that I will talk about later uh, called the database apocalypse, among other things. Um, but like I said, more on that later. Um, but basically, we come to the realization that um, we like functional programming and we want to do it on the back end too. Uh, and Rails is not hospitable to that. Um, there are some languages where you can sort of do a functional style. Like uh, I've, I've heard of people doing functional style Python. Functional style JavaScript is actually quite popular. Um, functional style Ruby is not a thing. Um, and so we started looking around and, and asking ourselves like, okay, what could we move to instead? Um, basically anything was fair game. Uh, we didn't have any, you know, preconceived notions around like, well, it's gotta be like this or that or the other thing, or like, well, let's rule this out or rule that out. We were just like, yeah, open any ideas, any language you can think of, we'll consider it as, as a potential target for our backend. So on here, we got uh, from left to right, that's F Sharp, Elixir, Java, Scala, Clojure, OCaml, Idris, TypeScript, uh, because by 2016, TypeScript was like becoming more of a thing, um, Rust, and of course, Haskell, uh, which is what we ultimately set, settled on. But um, we didn't actually start with, uh, with Haskell. So remember I talked about Elm is a pure functional language that compiles JavaScript, all functions are pure, full type inference, best package manager, nicest error messages. Um, well, although uh, Elixir is not these things, <laughs> um, it was what we actually ended up trying first. Um, so Elixir is a functional language that doesn't compile to JavaScript, rather it compiles to Erlang's Beam VM uh, bytecode. And it has a great concurrency and fault tolerance story um, doesn't actually have a type system, but it does have a static analyzer, which we had hoped would give us some of the same benefits as a type system. Um, spoiler alert, didn't, didn't really work out that way. Um, it has a, a nice package manager, like not as nice as Elms, but it's, it's uh, totally reasonable. Um, and if, especially if you're coming from Ruby, it has a nice learning curve because Elixir's like syntax and sort of style is very Ruby inspired. So our hope was that this would be kind of a nice natural transition from Ruby to Elixir, especially because a lot of the Ruby community was going from Ruby to Elixir um, at the time. And, uh, and, and that we would end up seeing some of the same sort of benefits that we, we'd gotten from Elm. Unfortunately, it just didn't work out. Um, Elixir is a fine language. Uh, it's not like it was you know, bad. We actually, you know, uh, we, we did our, our usual control experiment and we actually still have two services from that exp control experiment running in production today. They're still running, they're fine. Um, but, uh, but you know, it just didn't end up meeting what we were, we, we didn't end up getting out of it what we had gotten out of Elm. And it didn't feel like it was worth it to transition to something that was an improvement, but not as much of an improvement as we were hoping to see, um, which led us to Haskell. So Haskell is a pure functional language, which compiles the binary executable. So Elixir did allow side effects. Um, Haskell does not, much like Elm. Uh, so all functions are pure. Um, again, full type inference, sound types, uh, sound type inference. A bigger community than Elm. Um, I, I cannot say that it has uh, the nicest package manager around because um, <laughs> Rust is number two, and my, 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 the nicest package manager I ever used, uh, Haskell, is not number three. Um, but uh, it does have also a bigger ecosystem than Elm. Um, uh, and I, I have this in the, in the slot where with Elm, I had the nicest error messages. And let's just say that Haskell is not in contention for nicest error messages, um, at least among languages I've used. And I've used a lot of languages. <laughs> Um, so uh, we did a control experiment with Haskell as well. Uh, so find a low risk project that's a good fit, get it all the way into production, uh, and then expand incrementally or back out. Um, so uh, we did. And um, this is uh, an example of one of the cool things that sort of came out of that experiment. Um, this is uh, a screenshot from uh, part of our code uh, in the PostgreSQL typed library. And basically what you're seeing here is uh, a function call to app.modify exactly one, passing in, uh, don't worry about what log and DB do. But basically what we have here is an inline SQL query. And what's cool about this is that it's actually validated, not just syntactically, but against our database schema and our Haskell types. So when I say insert into this tutorials table, and I wanna insert the name and the description, this string interpolation syntax right here is going to actually do not only syntax checking, but type checking against the local name variable and the local description variable to make sure that these match the types of those columns. And because we have not only this, uh, which gives us compile time errors if we're trying to do stuff with our database that's uh, you know, mistyped or, or mismatched. And we also have this integration uh, called Servant Elm, which basically 
uh, lets us define types in Haskell and then automatically generate serialization, deserialization code uh, in, in Elm uh, so it can go across the wire from server to client without having to you know, do that uh, manually. Um, we've actually had it happen that we changed a column in our database and had one of our front end tests fail because we have that completely integrated <laughs> all the way across. Really nice, um, especially compared to what we were doing before. Um, so uh, we started off on Rails. Um, and I mentioned earlier that we had this thing uh, called the database apocalypse. And uh, basically, the, the, I'm going to give you the short version of this story. There's a blog post that I'll link to in a second that, that tells the full story. But essentially what had happened was that we'd run into something of a scaling problem, which is to say that, you know, millions of users. Great. Awesome. Right. Well, millions of users on a site that's all about students answering questions and stuff had translated into billions of questions, which again, great. Um, we did have a, uh, an embarrassing incident where we, uh, we ran out of primary keys because a 32 bit integer only goes up to 2 billion. <laughs> Oops. Um, that was a fun one to fix. <laughs> uh, but basically, uh, we, we started doing some math and figuring out, you know, if we keep growing at this rate, um, we're actually in jeopardy of running out of space on the biggest individual single server that Amazon will rent us. Um, that wouldn't be good because that's basically like, well, we just can't have a database anymore. We can't put new stuff in the database, um, which then hence the name, the database apocalypse. Now, this doesn't sound that bad. You might be like, well, why don't you just shard? Why not just, you know, add some more databases and just like, you know, balance between them. Well, the problem that we were finding was that our Rails code was so brittle that whenever we tried to make incremental progress on this, like we would, we would say like, let's just do a little like two month, you know, little two month project to try and like incrementally move us towards something that's actually, you know, closer to horizontally scalable. We did this more than once and every single time it just broke so many things within rails that we ended up having to completely roll it back um so of course every time we did this we we're like this is more and more concerning how do we solve this problem and i don't want to completely spoil all the details of the blog post but the short answer was what we found was <laughs> take the rails code rewrite a chunk of it in haskell such that it doesn't do anything different it's just in haskell now and because we didn't change how anything works in the entire Rails system, there's no like threads to pull on and you know things to, uh, to 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 get out of whack with or out of sync with one another. Um, it was doing exactly the same thing as before, just doing it over here in Haskell instead of in Rails. We we're able to incrementally sort of brick by brick move all the pieces over until we had enough of it in Haskell that now we could just make changes on the Haskell side. And by doing that, long story short, we we're able to avert the apocalypse and get a, a new system set up. And the result of this is that now, actually today most of our traffic goes through Haskell. Like this is our highest traffic, like part of our system. Um, by lines of code, we still have more Ruby code than Haskell because it's just had a many year head start on Haskell. Um, but we are, you know, uh, partly as a consequence of this, but also, you know, because of, for, for several other reasons, basically Haskell is now, you know, it's, uh, on the back end is for us what Elm is on the front end. Like that's what we want to do all of our new projects in. That's what we want to move existing projects over to, you know, whenever possible. Um, it's just a, it's, it's, it's sort of like night and day what we were able to accomplish in terms of this, basically the number one scariest technical problem, like biggest threat to the business that we had, Haskell was the way that we solved that problem. Um, as you know, business cases go, it doesn't really get much better than that um, for, for demonstrating the value of a technology to a company. Um, if you wanna hear the full story of that, uh, here's a link. Uh, I'll, I'll share the slides afterwards. So you don't have to like, you know, screenshot that or anything, but you know, that'll also, that'll also work. Okay, so um, top three benefits to our business for Haskell, um, pretty different than for Elm. Um, <laughs> number one here was just making changes faster and easier. I mean, literally we, we were unable to successfully make the change we needed to make with Rails, but with Haskell, we actually were able to do it and you know, avert the apocalypse. Um, number two, hiring again, like uh, we <laughs> are, let's see, I think our three most recent hires, um, well, one of them, okay, one of them hasn't actually signed the, the offer the other yet, so I, I shouldn't count my chickens, but uh, have actually were people who came to the company um, uh, interested in at least Haskell and in some cases Haskell and didn't even know about Elm. Um, so again, like this is something that attracts people to company. If you're, if you're looking to hire strong programmers, um, I think using Haskell is a good way to do that. And if anyone tells you you won't be able to hire anyone, ask companies who actually use Haskell if that's been their experience because I bet their experience is going to be more like ours than like what you might assume, not given that information. 
And then of course, uh, faster, more reliable software. Um, when I say faster, uh, so we did have a pretty, a relatively direct uh, comparison of like what our Haskell code was doing in production um, compared to our Ruby code. Um, now in fairness, Ruby is not known to be a particularly fast language. Haskell actually is known to compile to relatively fast code, um, especially if you're using strictness everywhere, which we are. Um, and uh, so, although it's not quite apples to apples in the sense that the Haskell code is doing slightly less because part of the whole reason we needed to change things was to offload some work elsewhere, but it's pretty comparable in terms of like what the Haskell code was doing compared to the old uh, Ruby code that it replaced. And it's about 10 X faster, like as in the throughput is about 10, 10 times higher, meaning that our theoretically, uh, you know, our, our, our costs for dealing with that traffic, um, or at least that, that, that part of the logic are uh, like one tenth what they were before in terms of uh, number of servers needed, et cetera. So that's also a benefit to the business. Although if I'm honest, like that's not the, the main benefit here. The main benefit is that we were able to like actually make changes to stuff um, that, that was too brittle to change before. Um, and if, if anyone um, would like to come at me with like, oh, well, you just, that's, you didn't TDD hard enough on the Rails side. Um, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> that wasn't the problem. Um, okay. Um, top three costs. Uh, these are uh, somewhat similar, somewhat different from Elm. Um, so again, fewer off-the-shelf SaaS integrations. Um, we did have to write our own uh, New Relic integration for like some server-side monitoring um, for Haskell. Um, uh, this is different from Elm. So the learning curve for Haskell is definitely, you know, I mean, you could argue that it's like the number one cost to the business, um, which is that, I mean, it's just, Elm is very easy to learn and Haskell is very hard to learn. Um, that's been my experience. Uh, we have in the past multiple times um, hired like uh, fresh bootcamp grads, like they've never had a programming job before. They pick up Elm in their first week. Um, we have not, since we adopted Haskell, we have not been hiring out of boot camps. Um, but if we had, uh, that's a conversation we would have. It's like, okay, how, how were we gonna have them learn Haskell? And honestly, probably what we would do, the strategy we would most likely do is um, have them learn Elm first and just only give them front end projects when they're starting out. And then after they've been using Elm for a couple of months, then incrementally move to Haskell. Cause honestly, I think if you're like one person we hired actually never done JavaScript either. Um, she'd only done Python. Uh, she went to a Python bootcamp. And in her first week, she actually thought having never used uh, Ruby or Elm, um, this is before we, we uh, done Haskell. Uh, she actually commented, uh, I was like, hey, you know, are you more interested in learning more, like doing more Elm projects or more Ruby projects? She said, I'm interested in doing more Elm projects because it feels easier. Like Elm for her was like easier to learn than Ruby, which is an object oriented language like Python um, dynamically typed and Elm felt easier. I mean, largely because the compiler said helpful, I think. Um, Haskell again, just it's just not the case. So um, uh, I think we would probably just uh, try some strategy where people learn, Has uh, learn Elm first and then transition to Haskell. Um, but the number one cost um, is honestly just not unique to Haskell at all. It's just transitioning away from the status quo. Um, we have a ton of legacy Rails code, and uh, you know, like I said, a lot of it's like pretty brittle to change. Um, unfortunately, like we have a ton of tests, but uh, it's not enough. And so um, this is not specific to Haskell because if we were moving to Elixir, we would have the same number one cost here, uh, which is you know transitioning away from the um, the, the status quo. I don't know what um, to what extent that would would have been true if we'd had like a bigger React code base when we were transitioning to Elm, but my sense is that it's actually, I think, easier to incrementally adopt things on the front end than on the back end, especially if you have a, a monolith like uh, like we did with Rails, because that's kind of what Rails encourages, the majestic monolith, they call it. Um, if we'd had like microservices, maybe this would be easier. Um, probably it would be easier, but um, microservices have their own whole set of downsides, so I don't want to pretend like that's a you know a free lunch either. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, it, it definitely uh, is is like, you know, the main, th the main issue that we have, you know, faced in transitioning to Haskell is just like, how do we do this incrementally? It's just harder to do uh, in our experience than it was on the front end with Elm. Okay, um, we have had some other like more recent experiments. Uh, Nix is one that's been very successful. We use Nix for like all of our development dependencies. We use NixOS for our CI runners, um, may end up using it for our production servers even potentially. Um, uh, Kubernetes also has gone well. I know there's like a big meme of like, oh, you don't need Kubernetes. I don't know what to tell you, we needed Kubernetes. <laughs> uh, we, we had a lot of very specific pain points and we looked at what was out there and it was either Kubernetes or like uh, HashiCorp Nomad or something like that. But um, as it happened, we had somebody who had Kubernetes ex uh, experience. So we ended up going with that. But like, we tried the route of like, you know, Yagni, you're not gonna, you ain't gonna need it. Um, and uh, we found that, no, we actually did need it. Um, post Graphon, we tried out, um, but ultimately was not a successful experiment, but fortunately we did it on a, in a pretty small controlled way as, as we do, and we're able to sort of uh, back it out. Okay, so to sum up, um, back in 2013, you know, very small company, 
no money, no, no revenue, uh, no functional programming. Um, uh, and then, you know, basically uh, between then and now, like uh, we introduced React, React grew. Uh, from React, we, we transitioned to Elm, Elm grew, so sort it of took over our front end, and then Haskell and Next came out of that. Um, uh, we did, you know, controlled experiments one after another, the latest of which has been Haskell. There will certainly be uh, others after that. Um, and this is our formula. Find a low risk project that's a good fit, get it all the way into production, expand incrementally, or if it doesn't work out, then back out. Um, and essentially, that's how we got from uh, 2013 to where we are today. You know, five employees to going to be over 100 by the end of the year, 60K lines of code to 1.2 million, thousands of users to millions of users. <laughs> no revenue to actually literally turning a profit. Um, and uh, we did it thanks to uh, uh, functional programming. So that's how we uh, got to millions of users in purely functional code. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you so much. That was really good. That was really fun. Um, I'm going to open the floor up to questions. So, okay. Anybody? Thank you. Um, I'm not familiar with Elm. I'm learning Clojure. Uh, did you consider Clojure Script when you were evaluating those languages? Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, David Nolan's actually a friend of mine. We, we hang out at conferences all the time. <laughs> uh, I actually was, um, before I tried Elm, I was actually uh, an advocate for Clojure Script. Having, I hadn't actually tried Clojure Script. I tried Clojure, but like we were talking about it at work. Um, and I, I, my advocacy was was kind of minor because I was like, well, first of all, I haven't actually used it. I, I've like tried out Clojure, but I haven't I hadn't actually tried Clojure Script. I was like, I'm considering it. Um, and I, ultimately, I think that uh, based on our Elixir experience, um, and I know that like Clojure is, is quite different from Elixir, so it's definitely not an apples to apples comparison. But for the things that we ended up wanting to get out of it and the style that we work, which is like, we've seen a lot of benefits to static typing. I know like Rich Hickey is famously not a fan of static types. Um, I don't know that it would have worked out for us, um, but having said that, it works out for lots of companies, and I would certainly encourage you to keep trying Clojure. And like, uh, I, I, a, a controversial thing that I believe is that programmers have preferences, and that's okay, and like normal, <laughs> and like some people really like just the way that Clojure is designed just like really speaks to them and really works well for them, um, and others. It doesn't. Um, I also know some people who like tried closure and were into it for a while and then switched to something else um, like with more static types. I also know people who've gone the other direction who, who really like static types and then end up um, on closure. Uh, so I would encourage you to find out for yourself uh, like what your what your own references are. <laughs> uh, does Elm have a REPL? Yes. You could just type Elm space REPL and uh, yeah, it's, it's REPL. <laughs> Hey Richard, mm -hmm. question for you, because uh, you meant just on the on the closure and Elm stuff. So I know we've talked to Elm in the past stuff, but and again, I did after your stuff. I got a side gig where I did some Elm in the evening on a UI to do essentially a giant bulk import. So wrote a table grid that pre filled and did a bunch of validations of the user data before it's like, hey, before we send this back to Rails. So that stuff almost fantastic for the like, cause I was like, I made some of these changes and we went from true and false. I went from true and false to be like, oh, here's a, like a validation thing with the error message. Nice. So you validate the input, you pop that up and you show it on the UI. I was like, I was able to knock that out in an hour and a half, that whole change through the code base. It's not huge, but it's enough because you're like following the compiler, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Also do closure, which is the, which is like, hey, if I got an experiment, I can knock it out easy. Elm, I found you have to wait and get a whole bunch of stuff constructed. Did you find anything with Pascal about like taking advantage of type holes or anything where you're able to kind of like, I've got part of this stuff that I know, but I don't have to build everything out. Is there any way to find that little happy balance between like small chunks that you get yeah. with the closure and the dynamic stuff versus the, once it's built out, we know what this is. And it's static. Have you found any trade-offs there, even from the elixir and stuff that you were doing? So uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, that that is that is a trade-off, um, and uh, it's one that now that I'm working on a programming language frustrates me because I know it doesn't have to be that way. <laughs> uh, yeah, Josh is not because he knows what I'm about to talk about. Um, 
So Haskell has a, feature, a, a compiler flag called defer type errors, which lets you basically, um, if you were going to get a type mismatch, it will instead pretend it's OK and, and just like generate a runtime error instead if you like actually get to that code path, which is essentially what you get in a dynamic language, which is to say like it doesn't block you at compile time. Um, but if you if you do actually encounter the problem, then eventually you know the, the type mismatch will have a consequence. It's just it will only happen if you get to that code path when you're writing the program, right? Um, like you know, that's how you have like type error at runtime. You know, undefined is not a function is the, maybe the most famous one. Um, so you can do that in Haskell for type errors, but honestly, we haven't really used that much at work. Um, it's only for type errors. It's not for like naming mismatches. So if you like you know, are in the process of like renaming something or, or changing some other things around that, that uh, type check or, or have problems like earlier than type checking. Um, it doesn't really help, but, uh, and I also like, I think culturally we're just all so used to it that like um, we just sort of like do it now. But what I mean by it doesn't have to be that way is that there's no reason that a compiler can't just have the best of both worlds as far as I'm concerned. And just like, if there is a type error, tell you about it, but also just, not stop there, just keep going and actually generate the code and let you run the application if you want to. And then if it encounters that type mismatch at whatever you know branch of the code, then you know crash then. But just do both, just tell you about it at compile time, but just as an FYI and not as a blocking thing. Um, so that's what Rocks compiler does. Uh, it, just, it just does both. Um, so uh, there haven't been enough big rock projects done yet in existence to know like how beneficial that is in practice. But um, the reason that I designed the compiler that way is for exactly the reason you were just talking about. Like, I, it's a it's a trade-off that exists in every type checked language I know of. Um, but I don't think there's a technical reason that it has to be. And, and now we know there's for sure not because we already do it. <laughs> That's a good point. Question? Yeah. Uh, if you were to do this application all over again from scratch money no object would you even be using react at all oh no no we wouldn't we wouldn't have bothered yeah okay and, and like we don't um the version of react that we're using is like 0.12 or something because that's the last time anyone wrote any new react code um the only javascript code the only new javascript code we ever use is like if we pull some library off the shelf like that rich text editing thing um, it's never like we we write React code, <laughs> so yeah, we we definitely would not bother with React um, okay. at this point. And what's the status of IDE support? Uh, there's like a language server plugin uh, for Elm. Um, I uh, personally use Vim, and, and I don't know. I'm I'm kind of cranky about language servers and speed and stuff, um, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I don't personally use it, but I, I, I know people who use it and like it. Um, I just use Vim with like the standard like Vim integration. Like when I save it, it gives me an error and like, you know, red squiggly underline and stuff like that. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of the wrong person to ask, but I also am like aware that like people, lots of people in the community like use the Elm language server and like it. I'm going to give you the award for the most information in the shortest amount of time. But my question <laughs> is, how many cups of coffee did you have before you started? <laughs> uh, believe it or not, I actually don't drink caffeine. <laughs> I, uh, I I used to, but I had a heart thing, and it, it I long story short, I, I I tried lots of things to get rid of it, and then I stopped drinking caffeine, and it went away immediately. Um, so I have not had caffeine in a couple of years now. Yeah, I'll so just get some of this back. excited. Yeah. I just love programming. Yeah. <laughs> That's all there is to it. Uh, I, I mean, I guess you kind of have to like try and make a programming language because um, it's it's uh, it's extremely time consuming and also extremely rewarding. Um, but yeah, I think you got to love it to, to really want to do something like that. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, I have, I have a question. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering like with with Haskell, like I, I haven't uh, used it all that much. And, you know, I've used Elm a bit just on, you know, personal projects. Big, big fan, of course, but uh, uh, with, with Haskell, do you run into any, do you have any like special coding standards or anything just to keep the code like simple? Because uh, oh, yeah. from what I've seen, real world Haskell code is uh, extremely, I guess, abstract is, is the word. I, I, I know where you're coming from on that. So we basically um, write Haskell code as much like Elm code as possible. <laughs> uh, we, the, the, the joke name we use that internally is Elm flavored Haskell um, to the point where we actually ported and, and have open sourced um, Elm's uh, standard library as well as some of the other libraries like HTTP and stuff. 
Um, just because I, I also think like, I, I didn't talk about it just now, but a really underrated aspect of Elm is like how excellent the API design is, in my opinion. Um, I think like beyond just the language itself, like Evan did a really great job with the standard library and with supporting libraries like HTTP and like random and, and um, JSON decoding and stuff like that. Uh, and so we, we just, not only did we port it over those libraries, we actually also weren't happy with any of the test runners we could find. So we ported over Elm test to Haskell. It has the same like error formatting output and like API for defining your tests and stuff like that. I think we also open sourced that. Um, but if anyone can't find it, let me know and we'll open source that too. I, I think we did though. So you're writing something new, you said rock or something for your new language you're playing with? Yeah, um, happy to talk about that. I do, do we want to transition? I guess um, I, I, before we switch topics, I mean, cause it's a meetup, right? We can talk about whatever. Uh, I, I figured uh, I figured I'd just, you know, give anyone a chance to ask me any other questions about the talk, but happy to switch topics to, to rock as well. Uh, yeah, I, actually I have a question. Um, sure. Yeah, so yeah, I, I work as a React developer, but love Elm um, and I've started functional programming in my, my free time. Um, you know, what, what patterns maybe that, do you think it's, what, how, what, in what ways could Elm inform the way I write React to write more reliable code? Is, is that even like, an, like a valid way to think about the, like drawing patterns from, from Elm? Like uh, what, what, what would be your suggestion there? Honestly, I'm the wrong person to ask because I, like I said, it's, it's been years since I've touched React. Um, I, like, I don't even, I, I, I read about hooks, but I don't actually know what they are. Uh, I know it's like a, a, a newish thing. Um, I, I just don't know what the, and I remember looking at it and uh, not being a fan because it's like render is not a pure function anymore or like, and someone was trying to explain to me how it actually is, even though it can do side effects and I was not buying it. Um, but so I, I don't know, I, I just think I'm too far removed from having done React to have good advice there, sorry. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, so, you said that it's really easy to hire in Nordic uh, because like yes. everyone knows, know, like everyone in the Elm world uh, knows Nordic. Uh, yeah. So I was wondering like, what do you think about how important is evangelism uh, or being part of the community when you are acting in a like more niche language ecosystem? Um, yeah. That's a good question. I guess I don't know because I only have my own experience, which is, you know, at No Red Inc. Um, I, I do, like, I have heard from other companies that they've had a similar thing where, like, Elm is a big part of the reason that, like, people apply to their jobs. And they, like, since they started using Elm, they've gotten, like, a higher quality, like, applicants um, than they used to before. Um, but uh, what I can say is that there's, there's an innate benefit to just, like, if you go into Elm Slack, which is where everybody hangs out, there's a jobs channel, and there's, like, pinned jobs in there. And it's not that many. I mean, it's, like, you know, a dozen ish, like give or take, depending on like what day or what month it is. Um, it's like a pretty small number. So you're not competing with a lot of other companies for real estate, you know, at, at any given moment. Um, I know that there's like, you know, based on like past like state of Elm surveys, there's like uh, thousands of companies using Elm, um, but it's not like they're all hiring at the same time. Like a lot of them are like pretty small and, you know, not necessarily hiring or they don't post their jobs on like Elm Slack or something like that. Um, and so I, I think, uh, I don't think it's like necessary, uh, but I do think you, you do need to make people at least aware that you're using Elm and hiring. So partly that could be Elm Slack, but also just like writing a blog post about how, like I just saw in Hacker News today, Rakuten, I don't know how to pronounce that. It's like a Japanese company. Um, they blog about how they're, you know, using Elm. I know why they're doing that. They want to advertise that they're using Elm so people apply to their jobs. <laughs> uh, we do that too. <laughs> or, or, you know, give talks at meetups. Um, uh, as long as people are aware, like, um, you know, like we, we've already heard from a couple of people in the audience here to like use Elm as a hobby project. And, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's like the, the story we hear from a lot of people who apply to our jobs is like, I was using Elm as a hobby project. I'm using TypeScript and React at work. I like Elm so much better. I want to use it all day instead of only on the weekends. And so they apply. Um, so as long as people know that you're using it, um, I think that's the main thing. And it, that can just be a blog post really. And uh, just a follow up, uh, sure. as you are like starting to, to at least be more public about using Haskell as well, uh, do you feel like the same need to, to be part of those communities as well, like the Haskell community, or are you still like kind of like using the same pool of resources because of your, your knowing now? To, That's a great to, question. Yeah. Um, 
actually now that you mentioned i never thought about it until you until you just said it but um i mean i guess like we we haven't done nearly as much in terms of like you know haskell like publicity wise as elm i mean really it's just like usually if we mention haskell it's like along with elm it's like elm and haskell right like i just did you know a second ago um we don't we haven't really done any like dedicated haskell events like um we've like sponsored elm conferences um we, i mean i guess we've done some haskell specific stuff but um i think part of the answer there though is that um haskell is just like a lot bigger um it's not like you know people need to know about haskell it's like it's among functional programming languages like it's pretty hard to find somebody who's like familiar with functional programming and hasn't already heard of Haskell. Whereas I don't think the same is true of Elm. Um, so I don't think there's like as much of a gap there in terms of like awareness. Uh, so I don't know if there's like, I don't, I don't know what role we would even play in that to be honest. Um, but I mean, we certainly do want to make our name for ourselves within the Haskell community because we like, we do do Haskell differently than a lot of other country, uh, a lot of other companies. Um, I, I know that like, there is like kind of a movement for like simple Haskell and um, we're not like perfectly aligned with that, but like in spirit, yeah, like we're, we want to use Haskell as an Elm-like language, you know, like simple, don't, you know, don't overcomplicate it. Don't, don't use, uh, you know, all the language extensions, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, don't even use some of the basic ones. Uh, and, um, and I know that there's like a, a, a large subset of Haskellers who are interested in doing Haskell that way. So make of that what you will. <laughs> so are there are there any features of other ML style languages that uh, that you feel that uh, that uh, Elm could benefit for, with or from? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, yes, uh, but hmm. so the one that comes to mind is uh, actually um, polymorphic variants from OCaml, uh, which Rock uses. But I don't know how much it would benefit from it because the main way that we're, well, no, it would be nice. It would be nice because I, I was actually doing a project in Elm like last weekend and I missed it. <laughs> so I guess it does come up, um, but, but like not that much. Uh, it's, it, I think it would be a nice benefit, but not that necessary. Um, the main reason that we're using it in Rock is actually for like uh, chained effects error handling, uh, like accumulating errors. Um, I, I can't really explain it concisely without going on like a 15 minute tangent, which I don't think is a good idea in the middle of a Q&A. But um, if you watch some of the talks and like, um, oh, actually, I don't think any of the talks up there explain that. The next talk I'm going to give probably will go into it. Maybe we'll like see. A, like, an, like an error monad sort of thing. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, it can serve the same purpose, but like, okay, so basically I'll give it a super brief version. Um, let's say that I'm, uh, I'm like, I want to do an, uh, Oh, read, read data from a file. So Rock is for like, not for like web front end stuff, like unlike Elm, uh, it's like filling a, a niche that I, I want to exist. Um, so let's say I want to read from a file, uh, take the data that I got from, from the file, use based on that, like maybe it gives me a URL, make an HTTP request. And then after that, uh, write the results of that HTTP request to a file. Um, all three of those operations are going to have different error types. Uh, and so uh, how do you like chain them together? And like in Haskell, there's like, yeah, like you said, like error monad type stuff you could do. Um, or you can always just like map all, like define a custom error type that's just like all three of those different possibilities, like read error, write error, or um, HTTP error. Uh, and then like do a map over each of those tasks so that they all get translated in that type. That works, but it's like kind of verbose and annoying. Um, with uh, polymorphic variants, or as we call them in Rock, uh, tag unions, um, you don't have to do any work. It just, it just works. Like you just, you just say, uh, I, I want to do the file, open the file, like read from the file, do the HTTP request, write to the file, and then the type of the resulting task will just have the error be the union of all three of those possible errors, and that's it. Um, and then you can just like do one pattern match on it and be like, what if it was a read error? What if it was a write error? What if it was HTTP error? And that's it. Um, there's no extra work. Uh, so that's why it's in the language, and that doesn't really come up that often in Elm because like it's a browser you don't have file <laughs> operations like usually it's just like it, literally just an http request and that's it um but it does come up in, in in other domains um so yeah i think it's a it's a nice feature um and we definitely stole it from ocaml although we do it a little bit differently than they did um but uh yeah that's that's the one that comes to mind <laughs> so when you mentioned uh just how many companies are using elm uh could you give a source for this? Because I can't find anything about that online. And uh, oh. every time I try to find that, it's like 
outdated lists and uh, GitHub repo that is also yeah. outdated and yeah. So uh, that was from State of Elm, whatever the last time, like Brian did State of Elm for a couple of years and then was like, I don't want to spend time doing this. I'm not sure what value it is. This is an example of what value it is, but I understand that it was like, I think it was just dis a disproportionate amount of hours that he had to put into like scrubbing the data and like getting the, collecting all the results and stuff um, relative to what he thought people were getting out of it. So he stopped doing it. Um, and I don't think anyone else picked it up, uh, which maybe he was right that he <laughs> didn't think it was that valuable after all. But there was one state of Elm where um, and it was, this is an inference based on like number of thousands of respondents who said they're using Elm at work and being like, well, even if, even if like half of them work at the same company, like that still means there's definitely multiple thousands of companies using Elm. I don't remember what year that was though. Um, but I think all the state of Elms have had the raw data. So if you go back to the most recent one, I would assume that if you downloaded like a spreadsheet of that, it would probably, you could do the same inference that we did when we were looking at it. Cool, thanks, yeah. No, I'll sure. probably actually do that. <laughs> cool. cool. <laughs> I'm curious, what was the process like when you were transitioning to these languages in terms of like getting the team all on board with it? Because I'm sure there were some that were like, oh, but Elixir really was good or, you know, they had some other language they were holding out for. Uh, very different between Elm and Haskell. So when we when we first used Elm, we were still a pretty small team. Um, it was like, so I was on the front end. Uh, there was one other person who was on the front end, but he was a straight out of boot camp hire. And then everybody else is working on the back end, which is only a, a handful of people. Um, so there was some element of just like, well, of course the new bootcamp grad isn't gonna push back against the only other like senior front end person. Um, and, uh, and everybody else is sort of like, well, you made a good call with React. So uh, you know, we sort of trust your judgment and like your reasoning makes sense. So yeah, let's give it a try. Um, and I think there was a little bit of an implicit like, well, if it's actually not good, you know, it's like, it's, it's, I'll, I'll, I'll be taking responsibility for that. Um, Whereas with Haskell, it's like, we actually now we have like, you know, a lot of people on the team um, compared to before. And uh, and it was just like a, a much uh, higher learning curve. Um, it was just a totally different scenario. So um, with Elixir in particular, so we had two different people at the company who were really like gung-ho about Elixir and like um, really were like championing it and like driving it forward. Um, we also had some people who were like really excited about Haskell, but, you know, they were aware of like the learning curve consideration and the like, you know, uh, Elixir is like really close to Ruby. It really seemed like Elixir was the natural thing to transition from Rails to. Um, so uh, by coincidence, um, after we got those services in production, we're kind of like, eh, this isn't like exactly what we want. Not for this reason, but for unrelated reasons. Um, both of them ended up leaving the company. Um, one of them actually went to go work on a dedicated like full-time Elixir startup where like they were already completely transitioned, um, which again, understandable. Um, he really liked Elixir. Um, and the other person uh, for uh, totally unrelated, unrelated to any technology stuff reason uh, ended up taking a, a different job. So, um, so at that point we had like no Elixir champions left um, and still had several Haskell champions. So um, it wasn't that, it wasn't like we had anyone being like, no, no, I, I really wanna stay with Elixir. It was like, uh, everybody else was like in, sort of ambivalent one way or the other. Um, having said that, um, and I think there could be like a, I don't know, like a longer talk about just that whole process. Um, partly because of server side, but also just because like uh, the Haskell tooling, at least in the state that we found it, like I mentioned earlier, like we ended up porting the Elm standard library and the Elm test runner. And like, um, it's not just the error messages uh, from the compiler where the ergonomics are not what we were used to in Elm. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people, th th there's an inevitable comparison when you're like, oh, I want to run my tests. And you're like, why is this not as nice as Elm tests? And you're like, I want to do something from the standard library. Why is this not as nice as the core Elm? You know, and it wasn't like it was slightly less nice. It was like enough that, like I said, we ended up porting a lot of that stuff from Elm. Um, and so it was definitely a rockier transition. And and we so we did it more slowly. Um, like in 2017, we had, uh, like I mentioned, that was like when we did our first little experiment. Like it was like a, a full year before we actually started like doing a, a second phase of that. We're like we're like okay. This experiment worked, and I mean, a part of adopting Haskell is just like picking from the very large menu of different ways to do things. Um, it's like, what HTTP server do you want? What, um, uh, what like persistence uh, library do you want to use? Um, there's just a lot of like, <laughs> what standard library do you want to use? The only consensus on that is don't use the one that ships with the language. 
Um, so there's, there's just a lot of choices to make. Um, and, you know, we, we tried out different things and, uh, yeah, formatters, there's like four different formatters. Um, and then like what, one that's like a variation of one of the other four. <laughs> um, uh, so, so we, we ended up like just trying out a lot of different things and trying to sort of like figure out how can we get the, you know, the ergonomics as good as we can, you know, before we like roll this out to everybody. Cause we, we were kind of worried about honestly, like over committing to the wrong thing and having like too many sharp edges. So we did figure it out eventually, but I mean, it, it took a lot longer than the transition to Elm um, in large part because Elm's just sort of like, there's one way to do it. And it's really nice. Here you go. Um, you know, if, if you don't like it, okay. But like, this is how it is. Um, and we did really like it. Whereas with Haskell, it was just a lot, a lot more decisions to make. Um, separately, uh, that was not, also not helped by the fact that we still to this day have not found a book. I, I thought we had, um, there's like, we, we've had a Haskell book club for several years where we just like read a new Haskell book like together and like talk about it. Um, we haven't found one that we think is really good for like teaching professional programmers. Like here's how you use Haskell to build stuff at a company. Um, there is a relatively small number of them that like purport to do this, but at least the ones that we read, we didn't think were great. Um, some were better than others. Uh, but I, I, I recently asked, I was like, surely by now there's a book that I can like, when I, I specifically like when I'm, I'm, I'm going to go do this meetup thing, is there a book that this book club can recommend? And everyone's like, still no. <laughs> um, so uh, unfortunately, and, and that didn't really help either um, because like Elm has really great documentation also that like Evan wrote and, you know, like I, I separately wrote a book about it, but I mean, even before Elm and Action was a thing, like there, there were plenty of resources. Um, and that's, you know, my contribution, but like there's, uh, there wasn't a shortage before. Um, but with Haskell, it's like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. If you want to get into Haskell from an academic side, there's lots of material. Um, if you want to learn about, you know, uh, like Lambda Calculus in chapter one, you know, that's that's there for you. Like if you want to get to Hello World in chapter seven, that's also available. Um, but like, if, if you want to be like, I want to build a thing, you know, I want to build a web server. Like, how do I do that? Um, it's surprisingly hard to find that in, in the format that's like well-written and accessible and like all these things, um, or at least it seems to be. Um, so I'm not going to mention any books by name because I don't, I, mean, I, I know how much work it is to write a book and I don't want to throw shade on anyone, but um, so far we haven't found one that we thought was really good. And, and that was a contributing factor to why it took us longer to get transitioned over to Haskell. One of our hopes is that by sort of like building up the ecosystem and stuff like that, um, uh, that we can at least contribute to like, if others want to go down the same kind of path that we do, where it's like trying to write Haskell in a simple way that's like very Elm-like. Um, hopefully the materials can be better, but that's sort of a, a work in progress of our contribution. <laughs> Other questions? Do you know the meaning of the logo for Elm? Yes, uh, it's a tangram. So tangrams are this um, puzzle where you have, uh, I don't know, puzzle's the wrong word. Um, it's a set of like very small primitive shapes uh, that come in a box. And then you can, the idea is you can arrange them into like lots of different like pictures. Like there's one where you can do like a bird or like a, a person or a sailboat or various things like that. And the reason that Evan chose that was uh, basically um, like Elm, a tangram is something where you have a small set of simple primitives from which you can build surprisingly complex and interesting things. And that's sort of like the design philosophy behind Elm. Cool, thanks. Yeah, great question. I, I uh, I always like talking about some of the like like etymologies and like <laughs> origins of some of these things. Okay, so along the same lines, because we've had this uh, discussion um, in our group at, at least years ago, we had it. Um, does Elm see itself as a derivative of Haskell or from the ML line? From the ML line. I mean, it's certainly like, uh, like uh, I think what Evan said, it was he thinks that Haskell got the syntax right aside from, um, the type operator, which they changed from ML to from single colon to double colon. Apparently the story behind that is that uh, because they were doing, they were making Haskell to do research into laziness. Um, they were actually weren't that concerned about types. And so they figured that you're gonna be using cons all the time, uh, you know, for like, like lazy lists and stuff, but how often are you gonna write type signatures? So let's just make cons, you know, be the, the more concise one and the type be, one be the more verbose double colon. Um, uh, that's not how it turned out in practice, <laughs> which is why Haskell is like Haskell and then like PureScript, uh, I think is the only other language that, that followed that convention um, based on Haskell, but the, the whole rest of the ML family, it's single colon. Uh, 
Um, like, and so, yeah, Evan, Evan did that. He did it um, in college. He did a lot of like uh, standard ML type stuff. Um, and I think he would say that like there were Haskell influences into Elm, um, like with the module system, which is a lot closer to Haskell's than like ML modules. Um, but, uh, but I think he would say that it's, it's more a descendant of the ML family um, than like Haskell in particular, if you were here, <laughs> I think that's what he'd say. Uh, do you have any uh, ideas or wishes for the future of Elm in some way? Like if it would change in some way, what way would that be? Ah, interesting. Um, I have some minor ones. Uh, one would be, I wish that more types were considered comparable so they could go in dictionaries. Um, that would be nice. Uh, and, and sets. Um, oh, I'm blurry. What happened? Camera, figure it out. <laughs> um, uh, I also think it would be really cool if Elm compiled to WebAssembly, but uh, honestly, it's like already really fast relative to other virtual DOM systems. So that's like, I don't know. I just kind of like the idea of it. I don't. I don't think it's actually probably worth the amount of time and effort it would take in, <laughs> in reality. But I, I think it'd be it'd be cool. Um, what else? Uh, I don't know. Not that many. Uh, those are the main ones that come to mind. I guess there's like minor bug fixes here and there that would be cool. But I actually I can't even think of what they are off the top of my head because they're so few and far between that actually like seem to make a big difference. Um, I guess like a first class web sockets thing would be cool, but not for me just because a lot of people ask about that. But I don't know. I, I have never actually used web sockets, so <laughs> not not a personal thing. Yeah, my wish list for Elm is like pretty short. <laughs> so I got a I got a question for a wish list for you, Richard. Sure. Because I've heard some people in the Elm community want it on Node. It's the same way you can get like pure script and stuff on Node. Are you where where do you fall on the Elm on Node versus just Elm in the browser since you're looking at like Haskell and other things like that? So I've done Elm on Node because I wrote Elm test and it runs Elm on Node. <laughs> uh, but um, I mean, I guess maybe the most emphatic way I can answer whether I think Elm should be on Node is I'm making a programming language that's very Elm-like and works on those types of use cases. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I, I know what Evan's feelings are on that, which is that um, he has a vision for what uh, people would call like Elm on the server, and it's not what most people would think of, and it's more ambitious and higher upside and really awesome, but he's not ready to uh, talk about it at this point. So I don't want to um, get into that. But uh, I think his intuition that we can do a lot better than just Elm on Node is correct and worth pursuing. Um, so one of the reasons that I'm making Rock is that it's for like sort of the long tail of use cases that are not like usually when people say Elm on Node, what they mean is like Elm on the server. Um, that is a thing you can do with Rock, but it's not the main thing. It's like um, a lot more flexible than that or, or designed to be like targeting a lot more use cases than that. Um, like plugins, you know, database extensions, command line tools, desktop UIs, um, all sorts of different stuff. Uh, so I think if Elm on Node sounds appealing, I would hope that Rock would also sound appealing um, for those types of use cases. And I also kind of hope that that can like take some of the pressure off Elm so people maybe not feel as much that, that wouldn't be as much of a request. Like you said, I, I've definitely heard that too. Um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. With, Elm's, with uh, Evan's vision for Elm. And, and there was a bit, little bit of Elm is known for the Elm architecture. So what does that mean for a, like a node app when you're running in lambdas or something like that, where people would do pure script. So that's why I was kind of curious to what your take on it was with like the tooling of Elm oh. tests and stuff where you're like, the purity, the purity meets like, again, a lot of what people love about Elm is the Elm architecture, right? And, oh, the, sure. simpli I mean, and the simplicity it brings to thinking about the way it brings purity. Yeah, I mean, well, you can use the Elm architecture for, you know, any like UI app. I don't know that it's um, an amazing fix for arbitrary backend applications. I mean, in general, the idea of like message passing and like an update function for state um, is like a pretty reasonable model for concurrency, but that's like kind of a, pure function way of expressing like what Erlang does with like mailboxes and stuff, kind of, sort of, if you squint. Um, like actually in the Rock compiler, we have a section where we're like, 
loading lots of different files in parallel. And we actually use something that looks a lot like the Elm architecture for like how the messages are flowing through when you get like, oh, this file finished this stage. So now it's ready to move on to the next stage. It like sends a message back and there's like a coordinator thread that deals with all the other threads. That's all written in Rust. Um, so certainly you can do that, you know, as a pattern, like wherever you want. Um, and I know also like in UIs, people uh, use Elm architecture and, um, you know, JavaScript applications and stuff. Um, but as far as like, you know, a language putting the two together, what I think about Elm is sort of like the Elm experience, it, it really has to do with the like being the complete package. It's like everything is designed to work together to solve a particular like domain really, really well. Um, so I think that's that's what I love about Elm in the browser. And uh, if there were going to be an Elm on backend, that's what I'd want it to be is like, this is a complete solution and not just like, oh, it's, it's like Elm, but it's on Node. Yay. <laughs> you know, because that's like, uh, I don't think that's the best way to solve that problem in, in an Elm-like way. And I don't think Evan does either. <laughs> uh, how are your thoughts on uh, Rescript? Rescript. Um, so this is, uh, OK, so it started out as trying to remember the lineage here. Um, ReasonML. And ReasonML is a syntax for OCaml. Uh, and also a compiler tool chain via buckle script for compiling OCaml to JavaScript in the browser. And if you wanted to use that stack, it was ReasonML for the syntax and the buckle script compiler compiling OCaml through the OCaml compiler to JavaScript. Um, I know a number of people in that community. Uh, I've talked to some people who have used it. Uh, it I honestly, um, as an Elm programmer, it doesn't, uh, there's really no pitch for me. Like, it's like, I, I don't know what, like, there's no upside. Like, I'm, I'm happy with like the pure functional, like front end tool that I have that's sort of like all in one. Um, I don't see a lot of upside to being like, do, do I want NPM back in my life? I absolutely don't. <laughs> that's a big downside for me. Um, I, uh, I like the pitch of like, you can use React. I'm like, I like Elm better than React. I, why would I want that? That's a step in the wrong direction for me. Um, OCaml allows side effects and mutation. Again, that don't want them back. Um, but I appreciate that other people feel differently. I, I know at least one person who switched from Elm to OCaml because they actually prefer the like React style and you know the like more object oriented way. You know, I mean, it's like functional, but also you know has elements of object orientation um, at least compared to like the, the way that uh, Elm does it. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like I said, you know, people have preferences and that's cool. Uh, but for me, as like somebody who's happy with Elm, um, that I just, it's, it's, it's not for me. <laughs> In terms of like hiring, for example, or the community crossover, oh. do you see much? I actually don't, I don't know much about that aspect. Um, I mean, the reason that the hiring piece works out for Elm is that, and, and for Haskell, is that there's a lot more people who want to use those languages than there are companies who are willing to, a lot more strong programmers who want to use those languages um, than, uh, than, companies that are hiring for them. Um, so we, we, like, usually it's the other way around where there's like, uh, you know, most companies are like, ah, how do we find people? Like, like we were, you know, prior to Elm where it's like, there's, there's more companies trying to hire than there are, you know, like strong programmers available to, to fill those positions. Um, but for us, it's, it seems to be the, the opposite. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah. Um, but I actually don't know what it's like uh, there. So, I mean, it's predicated on there being enough interest and I don't know how much interest there is in Rescript, to be honest. It's, uh, I'm not saying it like is or isn't there. I just have no idea. Um, I, haven't, I haven't talked to the people in that community about that um, in, in a while. Uh, so um, yeah, I mean, assuming it's there then I would expect it to be the same, but I just don't know if it is or not. Like, I, I, like it's not like just by using a you know, less popular, less common language, you automatically get that. It has to be that there's that imbalance of like how many people like it and want to use it at work to how many companies are hiring. Um, and I just don't know if it's there or there. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Yeah. So to follow on just with the Rescript and Reason ML, one of the things I remember hearing as a selling point was like, hey, it's like React and React Native. You can compile down to, and essentially OCaml, you can compile down to your JVM for your Android phone or IO Objective C for iOS. Mm -hmm. Is is there any rumblings in the Elm community? Not Evan aside, because I know he's looking at other stuff about like Elm native. Like, are there any things that you've heard about people trying to take the Elm stuff and move it and be able to 
do it other than just like wrap it in a web view on iOS devices or Android devices? So there were a couple of projects um, a couple of years ago that that sort of went in that direction, but they just kind of petered out. Um, honestly, it didn't seem like there was much interest. I think they kind of got started because it's, it was sort of like a, wouldn't it be cool if rather than like a, we really want this for our business type thing. And I just think there just wasn't enough like will to like see it all the way through. I think part of that honestly is just that um, it seems like uh, in general, trying to target iOS and Android and like, the web at the same time has had kind of a spotty track record. Like some companies swear by React Native, but also there've been a lot of stories of like, they did it for a while and they're like, yeah, now we got to hire some iOS developers and some Android developers and, you know, like do it in their like native environments because it's this is not, like famously Facebook did that, I, I heard. Um, but anyway, so I, I don't actually know um, if that will ever, if there will ever be a critical mass of people who like where there's enough demand for that. But um, I haven't even heard rumblings about that in a while. <laughs> I don't know if I'm jumping the gun here, but uh, like using Rock, I know that there is like this platform abstraction. I don't know if yeah. I'm really going to talk about that, but is in, would it be possible in theory to compile to JavaScript through a binary? So like uh, actually have like Hawk compiling to JavaScript as a web platform? Uh, so Rock only compiles to binary, so it wouldn't go through JavaScript. But yeah, I mean, so you can compile Rock to essentially a C library. So anything that can speak C can use Rock. So yeah, you could totally go straight from Rock to iOS or Android. Um, I think I haven't actually done any iOS or Android programming, but I'm pretty sure that they both have like C interop. So in that sense, yeah, you could do that already today with the existing Rock compiler. Um, you'd have to build the platform, of course, which is a lot of work. But, <laughs> but if you're if you're willing to, all all the, all the uh, pieces are there in theory. Anybody can do that. They don't need to, uh, you know, just <laughs> build the rock compiler from source because uh, we don't have any releases yet. But uh, like I said, work in progress. But I mean, it is already powerful enough to do that. But is rock I, using? I, I, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I, I, go ahead. Just a, a, like a quick follow-on. Uh, I know that this is completely not the goal for rock, but uh, in theory, could I like use a platform to compile not to binary, but like to a file and every, uh, like essentially do the same as Elm does with JavaScript, but using the rock syntax. Uh, oh yeah, so sorry. So it, it, it compiles to a binary, but that doesn't have to be an executable binary. It can also be a library, like a C library. Like, uh, you know, like you can compile C to like either an executable like hello world, or you can compile it to like lib hello or whatever. And then some other, um, you know, program can import that, that compiled binary code as a C library and then uh, you know, do whatever with it. Um, it's, it's the same thing with Rock. You can either compile it to an executable or to a library. Um, so that's how you can use Rock for like building plugins, for example, um, like database extensions or something like that. Like anything that, um, anything that can, can talk to a C binary uh, can be used with Rock. So is, is Rock using the same compiler backend as Rust? Is it, is it built on LLVM? Or, uh... Uh, oh, oh uh, sorry, you said backend. Um, yeah, so uh, it has two backends at the moment. Um, one is LLVM uh, for optimized builds, and the other is incomplete, like feature incomplete uh, relative to the LLVM. Oh, the LLVM backend is also feature incomplete. But uh, we have a development backend that goes straight to machine code, um, which is not at par it feature parity with the LLVM backend yet. Uh, it's not like caught up there. Um, but that's for like speed, because LLVM. It's really nice um, in terms of like the optimized code that it produces, but it's also really slow. As in, like literally. Uh, <laughs> so if you if you do like um, a build on like a non like a release build on like a non-trivial file, um, we we don't have like a whole non-trivial project yet. We have, the best we have is like you know a <laughs> significantly long like a rock file. Um, half of the time is spent waiting for LLVM and the linker to like generate the binary. And the other half is everything else put together. It's like reading the file from disk, parsing it, canonicalizing it, type checking it, monomorphizing it. Like all of the rock specific stuff is like half. And then the rest is just like LLVM plus linker. Um, so that's why we want a dev backend that doesn't <laughs> use LLVM. So does this mean eventually WebAssembly? Because I yeah. know. I'm uh, like, nobody's working on that right now, but like um, a common thing that'll happen is like somebody comes by the rock Zulip and is like, hey, what about WebAssembly? I'm like, if anyone wants to work on it, let me know. I'm happy to help. Um, but like, uh, we don't have anybody who's like working on rock who knows WebAssembly is like familiar with it. Um, 
but it's like, yeah, I mean, all the pieces are there that it can compile to WebAssembly, like LLVM just does that. Um, WebAssembly is also like a binary format, like the instruction set's very similar. Um, it's not like it would be a huge project. It's just like, it's not trivial. And, uh, you know, if anyone wants to work on that here, you know, let me know. Uh, like I said, you know, happy to, happy to facilitate that. Um, so I, I kind of assume it'll happen eventually. Um, I don't personally have any WebAssembly related use cases that I'm interested in other than just like, it would be cool to have like a REPL in the browser on like rockline.org someday. Um, but yeah, um, definitely, uh, definitely assuming that sooner or later it'll happen. <laughs> Other questions? So venturing off from rock a bit, I know you're coming up to that in a minute. Uh, I really appreciated the controlled experiment you talked about. Yeah. And I'm curious, guy. So I'm curious, uh, what the experience is or how the experience differs from one language or ecosystem to the next. And if your success is in some ecosystems, for example, with Elm and Haskell, uh, affected the way you did future experiments. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, certainly. Uh, I mean, I guess like we've had some um, like parallels between them, but also uh, like some differences. Like obviously, like one of the nice things about doing um, control experiments in the front end is that there's like very little possibility of like, well, it's not a direct sense of like data loss. Like if you mess something up at the front end, like especially if you can stick to stuff that's just like presentational and not like necessarily um, recording stuff in the database, it's like, well, if you mess it up, like it, it looks wrong, but like, uh, you know, you can fix that without having to go back and repair things. Um, on the back end, it's like, riskier because if you you know get something wrong or like in, in trans something gets lost in translation maybe you have to go back and fix the data later um, maybe you can't if you get really unlucky um, secondly uh, there's this nice thing on the front at least with with elm and, and javascript where like you can have elm and javascript coexisting on the same page so it's it's pretty easy to just like integrate the two and like get them going um, on the back end if you want to do the same thing you have to get infrastructure involved. You have to like spin up a separate service and have them talk to one another. Or we actually tried at one point um, uh, having it run uh, in a different process on the same machine. And we even talked about trying to just do um, FFI with C as the intermediary between Ruby and Haskell and just having Ruby call Haskell functions. We didn't end up going down that road for various reasons. Um, but actually, and also the in-process thing, we ended up finding that it was just as much work as having it talk over the network, um, except that it, like we didn't get as much infrastructure tooling. It was it was more annoying, so we ended up just doing separate services, like um, like you know, people typically do. Um, so yeah, um, so so a lot of it was just like, well, this is just going to be harder than the Elm experiments that we did. Uh, so let's figure out how they're different and and how to like try to still make the experience as similar as possible since it went so well um, that time around. Yeah. Oh, uh, you're muted, Ted. Sorry. Hey, um, when you were introducing Haskell, wondering how long did it take you to sort of settle on um, favored libraries? And, and do you have a set of favored libraries? And could I find that list on a blog somewhere on your website? Yeah, I think um, I think one of our blog posts mentions it. If it doesn't, um, just like hit me up on Twitter and I'll, I'll uh, post it somewhere. Uh, uh, short answer is, um, so where we've ended up is, like I said, we, we rolled our own prelude, uh, which we, we have open sourced, um, and our own testing framework, which we have, uh, I think, open sourced, um, and HTTP also. Uh, for um, persistence, we use uh, PostgreSQL typed, um, which has been really nice. Uh, we use Servant for the um, HTTP server. Uh, we started out on Scotty, but long story short, it was not, uh, didn't, didn't do enough stuff that we wanted. Um, for like a JSON serialization between the front and the back end, uh, we use uh, Servant Elm, which automatically serializes the types um, on both sides. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I think those are kind of like the, I don't know, the, 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 the biggest ones. Uh, we don't use like um, any like lens or optics libraries. Um, uh, yeah. And it did, did it take you very long to settle on those? Were those pretty obvious choices? It did. Yeah, no, I mean, especially in the early days, like, like when we did the first experiment, like we we tried several different things. Like I said, we started off on Scotty. Um, i trying to remember what the, uh, and, and formatters. We, I think we tried like all four different like major formatters. We ended up on Ormolu. Um, 
but we considered four molu, which is or molu, but with four space indentation instead of two. <laughs> uh, again, to have it be more like L, but we decided that was like, we didn't, we didn't quite want to go that far. Um, uh, um, Kind of, oh, protolude. I think we I think we started with protolude, um, and then uh, for the prelude, and then we ended up uh, just doing our own Ellen flavored one. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we definitely tried out a bunch of different stuff early on, and that was a significant part of the like why it took so long to um, to like get 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 the, like Haskell this, this like similar level of traction that Ellen got almost right away. Um, and I think uh, hopefully we can you know by Publishing like what, what we found works for us, uh, maybe make that easier for other companies that have similar interests in terms of like how they'd like to be writing Haskell. Right. Um, any comment on something like the effects system or versus Rio versus ah, stacks? Yeah. So, so we use like the handle pattern. Um, it's not like an off the shelf effect system, um, but we I think we have blogged about that um, maybe in brief, uh, but yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a pattern. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Cool. Uh, other questions? All right. Um, well, I mean, uh, I don't know, we can talk about rock. I mean, I know we said like a while ago that we would <laughs> potentially transition that topic next, or I don't know uh, if, if people have questions about rock, or I, I don't know if I can like just like rattle off, you know, exactly what it is. I mean, I guess the short version is it's, it's an Elm like language, it compiles to binaries. Um, there's this whole concept of platforms and applications, but I don't know if I can concisely explain that. Um, I, I just gave a whole talk about it, uh, which is on the, the website. Um, uh, it's designed to be really fast, uh, and so far it is, <laughs> in terms of like how fast the compiler runs and also how fast the, um, the compiled output runs. Uh, I guess one of the cool things that this group might appreciate is that we're doing something, um, as far as I know, it's novel uh, among functional programming languages that are targeting like production applications as opposed to like academic research. Um, Cause there are some academic languages that do this, but uh, so we don't use persistent data structures. Uh, instead, what we do is we do this analysis at compile time to figure out when we can do opportunistic mutation and then use traditional like fast imperative data structures. So as an example, um, let's say that uh, I've got a, um, a record in Elm and I'm like, this record has like 20 fields and I want to do a record update, which in Elm would mean I'm going to copy this entire record over, except I'm going to change like one of the fields, maybe like two of the fields or something like that. So now they're immutable. So I have a new, a new copy that's totally separate from the original one and I can do whatever I want with it, but it's, it's all going to be immutable and, and so forth. Um, so imagine if uh, I say foo equals and then my record and then I say bar equals foo, you know, but with these fields changed. So if foo never gets used ever again, like after I defined bar, we didn't need to make a copy of it. Like we could have just used the one we had and just mutated it in place and no one would ever be able to tell the difference because it's just like that memory is never referenced again. So who cares, just reuse it um, rather than making a copy. Uh, so long story short, that's the type of analysis that Rock's compiler does. Um, and it's sort of like, based around that. So rather than using like closure does persistent data structures, Elm does some persistent data structures. Um, and that's like another way to make like copying cheaper, but basically rocks compiler tries to just actually not do copying quite often. Um, and so uh, instead of like linked lists as our fundamental data structure, we just have like flat arrays uh, with the same API as like Elm's list API, basically. Um, I guess the array API, because you can do like a get in the middle of it if you want by index, and it's, it's as fast as a, a normal array because that's what it actually is. So the hypothesis is that, and I base this on my experience with Rust, where it, it feels like uh, that's what we end up writing in practice, like most of the time anyway. Um, it feels like this optimization will kick in way more often than not, and we actually won't end up doing that much copying in practice. Um, we'll see if that ends up panning out. Uh, there's only one way to find out, which is to try it. Um, if it doesn't pan out, we can always like fall back on you know, persistent data structures and stuff like most languages do, but um, we have good reason to believe that uh, it'll actually end up being faster at runtime. And it does enable cool things like, um, so we did a, a benchmark. It's like a really silly benchmark, but it's, it's a cool result, um, which is uh, quicksort. Like we did handwritten quicksort, like textbook, just not optimized, just written out the way you'd write it out in the textbook. Um, in Rock, 
and then did benchmarks against same thing uh, written in Java, JavaScript, Go, and C++. Um, and all of them basically had the same implementation except the rock one because it's all pure functions had to use like recursion and you know, like uh, ostensibly lots of copying uh, of like uh, arrays. Um, but in practice, after all the optimizations ran, um, it was, uh, so C++ was the fastest, no surprise there. Um, back with the last time we ran that benchmark, Go was in second place, Rock was in third place, and then Java and JavaScript were, were behind Rock. Um, even though we were doing it on, a, we were quick sorting a million numbers, so they, their, their JITs were kicking in and able to like, you know, help out with that. Um, so that was pretty cool because uh, quick sort is like, for a pure function is like, um, almost pathologically bad. Like a pure function has like no business being competitive at that. It's just like, why would you ever write that in a pure functional style? Um, which is why we chose it because it's so like ludicrous that it would be at all competitive. Um, we think that with a, a round of optimizations that's or a new style of optimization that um, is currently in progress that will actually be ahead of Go. Um, but I, I can't claim that we've done it yet because uh, it's, it's, not, it's not in place yet. But it's close. Um, we're just like missing one last piece. But uh, yeah, it, it seems like if those optimizations work the way we expect they will, then we'll be faster than Go at quick sort, which would be pretty cool. <laughs> and only slower than C++ among those languages. Anyway, um, so yeah, uh, that's kind of the, I don't know, uh, some of the interesting things about Rock. <laughs> There's more on the website if you want to watch the, the videos on there. Um, but like I said, it's like very early stage, very work in progress. Uh, definitely not ready for any like production, you know, use or even like sizable hobby projects at this point. I don't know. Any, any other questions about Rock or Elm or Haskell or any functional programming topics? Whatever. It's a meetup. <laughs> Anything's fair game. I'm, I'm really happy that there is a, it seems like the ML line has been growing. Like, it seems like the, you know, like early on in programming history, like C line kind of took over, right? But yeah. uh, it seems like every new language I'm seeing is coming out of the, of the ML line of, um, huh. of languages, which is awesome. So <laughs> um, have, has there, you know, and obviously there's, there's, you know, other lines, the, the Lisp line. And, yeah. um, but is there any, uh, is there anything you've, you've, you've looked at the, say the Lisp or the, or the C, C uh, type languages that, uh, that you, you're trying to incorporate into Rock or? Uh... Um, in terms of incorporating it into the design of Rock, the language, um, there is a very minor thing, which uh, it's not like any any of these languages are like the first to do it, but actually David Nolan ended up talking me into this, but um, we did add um, optional record fields. Um, so this is like a very sort of niche thing, but like, so this, this comes up in certain rare circumstances at Elm, but it's like kind of annoying um, where basically, uh, let's say I, I made like a, the sortable table is a good example of this, like sortable tables, you can configure them in all sorts of different ways. Like how do you want to sort the columns? like which columns are sortable in this way and that way, you know, how do you want, like all sorts of different configuration options. Um, in Elm, the pattern for doing this, to, for specifying those is you make a, uh, like a default config record. And then whenever you're rendering your table, you pass in uh, a record update of default config with whatever things you want to change about it. Um, so in Rock, you don't have to do that because you can just specify, I have a record with optional fields and then they have a default, you know, set in, inside the function. Um, so you can just pass a record with like fields missing and they'll just get populated. Um, and it all works with the type checker and, and all that good stuff. Um, so it's kind of like a, a small nice to have. And that really actually came from a conversation with David Nolan about backwards compatibility. Um, and he was pitching me on being the first ML language to have both that and uh, either multi-arity functions or um, optional arguments in functions. And uh, we talked about doing that, but did not, I, I'm not convinced that that's, that one's worth it, but I think the optional record fields is, yeah. is worth it. Multi-arity has so many downsides. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, I mean, so you don't have to go that far. You, you, can, you can do um, uh, like, op like Elixir has um, default arguments, like optional arguments with defaults. Um, could do that. I, I, actually, I think they also have multi-arity, come to think of it. 
but in the code, there's like in the in the documentation, there's like special syntax for the default arguments. Um, but I, I, I took a look at it. I was like, okay, so how would I like change some of these like rock library functions if they had default arguments? And I also looked at Elixir's standard library and was like, how would I change these functions if they had default arguments? And like nine times out of ten, I'm like, the API with the default argument seems worse. <laughs> um, I would actually like. I think Elixir would have a nicer standard library if they didn't have that feature. That's probably controversial to Elixir folks, but um, as someone who doesn't use it, I can just you know take shots, right? Um, uh, but yeah, I um, so I'm not convinced. There, there are some cases where it's nicer, but it seems like they're outweighed by the number of cases where it's just like an API foot gun, where like using it just results in something that's worse, even though it's kind of like appealing, um, which I don't like. Um, but yeah, uh, so. Now that was the, the question was um, things that like I've incorporated into Rock the language uh, from non ML uh, family languages. Um, so another one from Rust uh, is two from Rust. Um, inside when you're pattern matching, um, I don't maybe there are other languages that have this, uh, but Rust is the only one I know of that has it. When you're pattern matching in Rust and also in Rock, uh, you can do a branch that has multiple patterns. So you can say like uh, green pipe blue pipe orange which means green or blue or orange all of those match this one branch and you know run this code if they're in there um uh also you can do uh if guards on them so you can also say like green pipe blue pipe whatever if um x greater than seven or something like that and you can use inside that conditional uh the, the guard um uh variables that are in the pattern match so you can say like uh like if you're doing a, a pattern matching on a result you can say like okay x if x greater than five or something like that and then this branch will match only if it was an okay and what was inside the okay was greater than five um just nice to have it's like it it's just makes the um the the pattern match like a, a little bit um i don't know easier to organize i found uh whereas otherwise like if you sometimes need to like nest more conditionals or uh have multiple branches that call out to a helper function anyway Look at active patterns in FSHR. Uh, I haven't heard of them. Uh, they're pretty neat. They're kind of a way to functionally decompose a pattern match. So, so cool. you can then kind of use them, and it'll it'll um, it'll actually kind of enhance the syntax. It makes the patterns a lot simpler for some some use cases. Cool. Okay. I'll I'll uh, I, I just looked it up and put it in another tab. So I'll I'll, I'll check that out later. Thanks. Can you say more about that, David? I'm not familiar. Um, it's so it's it's one of the features, one of the kind of nice features about about F sharp. Um, so if you're if you're pattern matching against properties, for example, so if you have a um, say, so if you have a, 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 a like a record as one of the things that you're matching against, you can you can create an active pattern that makes it simpler to match against the properties on that record and or you know uh you know consoles or other other things um but they're they're really neat and you they basically look like another like a like a variation on a standard function um but then they're they're you can hook them into your patterns uh to kind of enhance the syntax cool Cool. <laughs> See ya. Uh, yeah. Other other questions or thoughts or topics? Anything is fair game. So we've started to lose some people because it's been about two hours. Um, yeah. I'm going to turn off the recording now, and then we can you know really talk shit. <laughs> Are you going to wait for the recording to go off before you said that? <laughs>